Pleasure to introduce one of our fellows, Mike uh, Avalion, who uh, trained at uh, went to medical school at UVA and uh, was in the military in ROTC during college. And we, I think you got to help you put, go through medical school. So he's now doing his resident. He did his residency at Tripler Army Hospital in Hawaii with one of our former fellows. And uh, he's now uh, in his first year of fellowship with us. So Mike, take it away. Uh, talking about osteo uh, osteo lesions of the temporal bone. Go for it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to talk about osseous lesions of the temporal bone. Here's the outline. We'll talk about embryology, and then we'll cover the following disease processes. So the neurocranium surrounds and protects the brain. It's divided into the cranial base, which is green, on this diagram, and then the cranial vault, which is light blue. The visceral cranium comprises the fa facial skeleton, which is dark blue and yellow. The cranial base, consisting of ethmoid, sphenoid, petrous, mastoid, and occipital bones, is formed by endochondral ossification. Now, the top right figure shows endochondral ossification. It's the process whereby chondrocytes initially form a cartilaginous model of the future bone. Starting at primary centers of ossification, osteoblasts then gradually replace the cartilage of bone tissue. Now the viscera cranium is formed by intramembranous ossification and forms so that you can see in the bottom right figure whereby mesenchymal tissue condenses and forms a highly vascularized membranous sheath. Osteoblasts then differentiate from those precursor cells deposit osteoid, which is calcified and vascularized. Now let's go over some basic histology. So osteoprogenitor cells are the stem cells of bone. They're the source of new osteoblasts. Osteoblasts line the surface of bone. They secrete collagen and organic matrix of bone called osteoid, which becomes calcified soon after it's been deposited as they become trapped in the organic matrix they become osteocytes. So osteocytes maintain the bone tissue. They have these processes um, that ramify through the bone, forming gap junctions with other osteocytes. Osteoclasts are large multinucleated cells with a ruffled border that resorbs bone matrix. And you can see that's what the arrows are pointed at in this bottom right figure. They're not derived from osteoprogenitor cells. They actually derive from blood monocytes, which are derived from hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow. So let's cover these disease processes. So fibrous dysplasia is a spontaneous, non-inherited disorder of osteoclast and osteoblast function, characterized by a replacement of normal bone with a variable amount of fibrous tissue in woven bone. Underlying this is a G protein mutation on chromosome 20, which leads to overproduction of cyclic AMP. This leads to a hyperproliferation of incomplete, uh, hyperproliferation and incomplete differentiation of marrow stromal cells into abnormal osteoclasts. It also inhibits osteoplastic specific genes and it stimulates cytokines that promote bone resorption by osteoclasts. And ultimately, this leads to disorganized, weak, and immature bone. It occurs in one to two per 30,000 people, and most majority of these patients are prepubescent. It most commonly involves a craniofacial skeleton and the temporal bone in 20%. So the right, you have a figure of an 11-year-old girl with a monostatic fibrous dysplasia of the left zygomatico-maxillary region. It was gradual and asymptomatic. Her dentist, her dentist noted delayed eruption of teeth. They got a panorex and then um, subsequent CT imaging demonstrated that pathognomonic ground glass appearance, which we'll go over soon. So there's three types. There's monostatic, which is isolated to a single cider bone. There's non-syndromic polyostatic, which is multi-site involvement. And then there's McCune-Albright syndrome. So monostatic is the most common form. 
and it usually occurs in the skull, ribs, femur, or tibia. In the polyostotic form, the skull lesions are seen in more than 50% of patients. So uh, monostotic fibrous dysplasia has less bone deformity, and there are no evident, there's no case reports or evidence of it converting to polyostotic. McCune Albright is the rarest. It's defined by um, two of the three, you have to have two of the following three features, polyostotic disease, um, excessive hormone production, an example of which most commonly is precocious puberty and unilaterally, uh, unilateral cafe au lait spots as seen in this photo. So this systemic effect of cyclic AMP overproduction is evident in McCune Albright syndrome. Cafe spots are, are from the overproduction of the enzyme tyrosinase, which is a rate limiting step in melanin production. Additionally, the endocrine problems associated with McCune Albright um, syndrome are can be related to this G protein activation. And then interestingly, the syndrome is named for two physicians, Donovan McCune and Fuller Albright, who actually separately described the triad in 1937, and then they came together and, and uh, had it named after them. So the symptoms, 75% are symptomatic, 50% have cosmetic deformity. This is an example on the top right, uh, a young adult male with involvement of the frontal table. Typically, limb pain and fracture is the first symptom. Uh, they may have leg length discrepancy or weakened bone leading to bowing, as you see in the bottom right figure of an 11-year-old girl. From a neurotologic standpoint, um, headache is the most common, followed by conductive hearing loss, um, ear canal stenosis, and then cholecystiotoma. Facial weakness and central hearing loss are very rare, and the degree of symptoms does not correlate, the degree of disease does not correlate with symptoms. This may be exacerbated by pregnancy or oral contraceptives, suggesting estrogen's involvement in the disease. So this is an audiogram of a 15-year-old male with uh, monostatic disease. They have otalgia and conductive hearing loss. The image demonstrates A, sparing of the fallopian canal, B, malleus fixation in the epitympanum, and C, uh, external auditory canal stenosis. This is a 71-year-old male with monostatic disease and conductive hearing loss. It shows obliteration of the ear canal with cholesteatoma and you can see the um, associated hearing test. So um, diagnosis, aside from biopsy, fibrous dysplasia can, common, can best be characterized by the CT, which commonly demonstrates bony expansion, loss of the normal corticomedullary definition with this inside out uh, pattern of bony dysplasia. You can see as it erodes from inside to out, leaving the cortex for last. There's a classic ground glass radiopaque matrix in the, major, in the majority of cases. And then um, fibrous dysplasia involving the skull base and temporal almost always spare the otocapsule. You can see the otocapsule is spared, the arrows pointing that. Less commonly seen is a, um, is a uh, lucent variant in approximately 20% of cases. And this, uh, you have to have a high level suspicion and biopsy this of concern. Most people would biopsy that to rule out malignancy. So on histologic exam, one observes a dense fibrous stroma with this Chinese character architecture you can see here with out osteoblastic rimming. Um, and this is the, these are the trabeculae. Um, on the bottom side, of the cochlea, you can see the normal bony trabeculae and adjacent trabecular cavities in the petrous apex medial to the cochlea. The trabeculae are organized, interconnected, and there's no fibrous stroma. So this is a normal slide. This is a normal trabeculae, and then the, the trabecular cavities, they're interconnected, they're not hyperdense, there's no fibrous stroma. So you can see the difference. So the um, management, the natural history is variable and unpredictable. So you have to counsel patients um, about that. Um, but more common that they, um, the disease is monostotic. 
you can screen for endocrinopathy or you can refer to a uh, endocrinologist. Surgery is for symptoms or um, cosmesis. The thing to be keep in mind is that the bone is very gritty, vascular and compressible. Um, now Baja has been successful. The only data I could find was for three patients. However, failure of in osteointegration is more likely in patients with abnormal bone transformation. So if they're still in the process of um, bony changes, it's not a stable disease, um, you can have a failure of osteointegration. So the best thing to do is to use your CT to decide on which is the most stable, highest quality bone and use that for implantation. Decompression has actually been successful for hearing loss. Um, this is a 28 year old female with um, fibrous dysplasia with gradual sensorial hearing loss, tinnitus and facial twitching. She, this is three years um, post-op from middle cranial fossa decompression. You can see the pre-op audiogram and the post-op audiogram. Um, if there is sudden growth, then you want to biopsy because this could be an osteosarcoma or any other bony malignancy. All right, so moving on, osteopetrosis. So this is first reported as marble bone disease in 1904 by actually radiologist and gynecologist, Albert Schonberg, as you can see in the top right in 1904. It is a group of inheritable metabolic disorder, bone disorders characterized by dense sclerosis and faulty remodeling, remodeling from mutations in osteoclasts. And this leads to accumulation of all bone that is normally resorbed. So this is reaccumulation of partially resorbed bone um, at least of this dense sclerosis. And it mainly affects the axial skeleton and bones of endochondral ossification. As we talked about earlier, that endochondral ossification is also um, the way that long bones are formed. There is a, there are two types. Um, the uh, congenita or malignant form, which is autosomal recessive, and then the tarda or autosomal dominant form. The autosomal recessive form is due to various mutations affecting osteoclasts, and that leads to cerebral calcifications, blindness, and obliteration of the marrow cavity, which leads to pancytopenia and ultimately um, often death um, before 10 years old. Um, secondary to hemorrhage anemia or infection. Now the more common dom autosomal dominant form is known as the TARDA variant. And we'll talk about the two different types of the TARDA variant. Um, and that's associated with multiple gene mutations and that which um, result in a faulty chloride channel in osteoclasts, which acidifies the environment required for bone breakdown. Now in pathology, there's persistent calcified cartilage and endochondral ossification. And this leads to immature bone that is dense and brittle. Uh, okay. Now the, the pathologic symptoms of osteopetrosis arise from the narrowing of spaces, canals and foramina, along with direct bony infiltration. The congenita type is usually manifest by blindness hearing loss, dentition abnormalities, macrocephaly, failure to thrive, pancytopenia, and hepatosplenomegaly. Now you can see it on the top right. This is an image of the um, optic disc through fundoscopy sh showing a pale optic disc that's seen in opti optic nerve atrophy. The TARDA variant is diagnosed usually late in childhood or adulthood, and most often discovered on x-ray with broken bones. The most common neurologic finding is loss of vision um, from optic nerve atrophy, and then um, uh, subsequently conductive hearing loss or other cranial neuropathy. 60% of patients are symptomatic, and um, that is often due, like I said, to foramenal narrowing, as you can see in the bottom right. This is a, IAC, a coronal cut, the IAC, and you can see the um, this is the diameter is 1.9 millimeters. Now, um, this may lead to recurrent facial palsy or spasm. As well, osteopetrosis um, knows no bounds, and it can. Uh, it also involves the ossicles and the otocapsules. The ossicles may be distorted, 
with foot plate abnormalities. Now, this is different from, from fibrous dysplasia. So the diagnosis. Now, aside from biopsy, again, the diagnosis is radiographic in conjunction with clinical findings. You have this diffuse involvement of the calvarium um, in the oic capsule with this chalky sclerosis and thickening um, with narrowing of the foramina and spaces. Now, there are two types of the autosomal dominant form. Type one is sclerosis of the entire cranial vault, as you see in this case. And type two, you have the cranial base, which is sclerotic, but you also have um, the effect, uh, uh, an effect of the spine. It's called end plate um, thickening or rugger jersey spine. This is a, a rugger rugby jersey. Um, that's why it has that name. So there are actually subgroups of these osteopetroses and one of which notably is engelmann camerati disease. And this is, um, has findings similar to osteopetrosis, as well as progressive sclerosis of the diaphysis of the bone. That's the long portion, the mid, long mid portion you can see um, of the bone with preservation of the cortical thickness of the epiphyses. This is a, um, uh, the bottom right is the patient with a 57-year-old male with recurrent bells and facial spasm, co middle cranial fossa decompression leading to resolution of facial spasm and paralysis for at least one year at the time of the study. The histopathology, um, this is a right tumor bone of an eight and a half year old male. On the left, you can see a horizontal section of the right tumor bone shows extreme increase in the density of the bone Changes are most severe in the periosteal layer, involving an extreme reduction of marrow spaces. The mastoid is non pneumatized and the antrum area is filled with compact bone. In this middle image, the facial nerve is pushed down due to bony overgrowth towards the stapes. Um, and the superstructure of the stapes, you can see by that black arrow, is embedded into the dislocated facial nerve and has compressed it to approximately one half the original size. The cruise of the stapes appears to be immobilized. This compression of the facial nerve by the stapes is hypothesized to be a cause for failure of facial nerve decompression. And on the right, you have a section of the 15 month old, the endochondral layer of the otocapsule and stapes is composed of that calcified cartilage, the immature bone. So management, so for asymptomatic patients, observation is uh, with conservative management is the first source of action with discussion that remote majority remain benign, though again, there's a variable course. For treatment, vitamin D has been used to stimulate osteoclast function. Interfering gamma may stabilize the disease and bone marrow transplant in severe cases. Now this would be taken over by a rheumatologist or endocrinologist. So interestingly, um, this uh, top right is a study of a three month old patient with congenital disease who had reversal of optic canal stenosis after bone marrow transplant. And this makes sense since the precursor to the osteoclast is a monocyte, which is hematopoietic um, bone marrow cell. Now, non-surgical amplification should be considered first. Osteoculoplasty can prove difficult as the middle ear may have dense bony disease and there may be stapes and foot plate abnormalities um, such as obliterated or thickened foot plate primitive stapes um, embedded in the facial nerve or persistent stapedo artery. Now, um, again, it's important to realize that um, um, the uh, surgical findings um, when doing any kind of procedure, such as facial nerve de decompression. Um, this middle uh, right image is the bone flap of a 57 year old male who under middle cranial fossa decompression for facial palsy. This bone flap is three centimeters thick. Um, this is, this is a, a, a horizontal cut uh, section through it. Now, um, special attention should be given to children. A three-year-old male when it underwent attempted middle cranial fossa decompression with the same thickness bone flapped. However, the dura was effaced 
and the surgeons encountered brain immediately after craniotomy. This then herniated through the defect and the skin had to be closed over and the child was eventually taken back to open suture lines and resect non-viable brain tissue. The consensus is that hydrocephalus and intracranial hypertension may be occult and congenital osteopetrosis. Now, cochlear implantation has been successful. A case report of a 52-year-old female with osteopetrosis and a um, profound PTA bilaterally um, underwent uh, implantation with a cochlear nucleus 5. Um, other than the extremely thick and dense um, bone the mastoid of the mastoid, the surgery is uneventful. And their, her uh, speech recognition six months after surgery was 75% and his results are stable at three years. There's no evidence for, for prophylaxis, uh, prophylaxis decompression of the facial nerve though. So Paget's disease, um, this is first discovered by James, Sir James Paget in 1877. He was an English surgeon and pathologist who considered with Rudolf Virchow as one of the founders of scientific medical pathology. Notably, his first patient with Paget's disease was somewhat deaf. Um, it is the second most common metabolic bone disorder after osteoporosis, and it's characterized by osteolytic and later osteoblastic changes that mainly affect the axial skeleton. Um, there's an unknown idiopathogenesis. However, their gen genetic factors do play a role, which may be inherited in an autosomal dominant um, with incomplete penetrance pattern. Now, while there have been um, four lo loci that are um, associated with this disease, and the, one of the mutations is an SQSTM1 uh, gene. Um, additionally, there have been measles virus has been implicated in the disease. Um, a 2011 study examined the bone marrow of patients with Paget's disease, which demonstrated expression of measles virus nucleocapsid protein. Um, testing has shown that the presence of this nucleocapsid protein increases production of IL-6, which in turn leads to osteoclastic changes that are seen in Paget's disease. Now, this becomes more prevalent in age as you get older. And the onset of clinical manifestations is usually in the sixth decade of life and it includes enlarging skull, top right image, and then progressive kyphosis, you can see in this bottom right image. Um, the bone is often immature, de soft, deformital, and fracture prone. Now, Hearing loss is a prominent feature of Paget's disease. Surprisingly, the most common pattern is a downsloping, high-frequency sensory neural loss, often with a low-frequency conductive loss. None of the many published studies uh, have clearly identified a consistent pathologic basis for the hearing losses. Specifically, the apparent conductive hearing loss is not caused by a secular fixation, and the sensory neural hearing loss is not caused by compression of the cochlear nerve fiber, fibers. Shuknik and Katarpol perform histologic analysis of 26 temporal bones with Paget's disease with audiometric testing of those with conductive hearing loss. There was no a cause identified and no evidence of a secular fixation, nor is the, there a cause for the sensory neural hearing loss. It was concluded that the hearing changes and are caused by changes in the bone density mass and form that serve to dampen the finely tuned motion mechanics of the middle and inner ears. Monsell and colleagues reported a, st a statistically significant correlation between the bone mineral density of the cochlear capsule and the high frequency pure tone um, average, as well as the air bone gap in patients with Paget's disease. And this image to the right shows the CT scan of a middle-aged male demonstrating sclerosis and thinning of the otic capsule, as well as a um, twisted course of the right internal auditory canal and the ossicular chain is unaffected. And here's the um, associated audiogram. Now tinnitus is present in 20% and it may be pulsatile to the vascular nature of the disease. 
you may have this um, imbalance, not vertigo, in um, a quarter to a half, and cranial neuropathy is very rare. Now, basilar and vagination may occur with Paget's disease because one third have an increased head circumference and they have this soft deformable bone that's very heavy. And so this leads to sagging of the foramen magnum over the odontoid process leading to basilar and vaginism. This can lead to hydrocephalus, cranial neuropathy and vertebral basilar insufficiency. Aside from biopsy, Paget's disease is diagnosed radiographically and with laboratory values. This increased ALP is from bone turnover. Technetium 99 diphosphonate bone scan can be used and is the most actually the most sensitive imaging modality to detect pathologic changes. Um, so the top left is an example of a patient's humoral head as used as baseline prior to bisphosphonate therapy. Now on high resolution CT, you can see demineralization of the patrous pyramids. Um, which is the site of greatest marrow deposition and associated thickening and marrow expansion of the calvarium, which are the first changes. So top right is an axial T1 post-contrast fat suppressed MRI, which demonstrates extensive expansion of the occiput and right otic capsule. The hypervascular nature of the disease process is demonstrated by heterogeneous enhancement of the right temporal bone white asterisk here, which is significantly more prominent compared to the left. Now we'll show the corresponding CT. The, um, you can see this corresponding area of enhancement and expansion on the, for the right petrous apex, this dense sclerosis, and then notably this widening of the diploic space, which is characteristic of the disease. Now as the disease progresses, on the bottom left, you see the sclerotic bony changes here and the thinning of the, of the otic capsule. This eventually progresses to this cotton wool appearance of the bone, notably the ossicles are ineffective. Now, distinguishing features of Paget's disease compared to otosclerosis are a later age of onset, greater incidence of central low hearing loss, uh, enlarged calvarium, and then elevated alkaline phosphate along with this, um, this, these CT findings. So again, here's a progression of the disease. A is initial diagnosis, B is six years after diagnosis, and C, uh, C is 15 years later. Initially, you have this thickened calvarium with this white arrow showing the thickened calvarium with patchy sclerosis and lytic lesions. The, consistent with the osteolytic phase. As you progress, you get this widening of the, the diploic space and expansion of the calvari calvarium, which is accompanied by patchy cotton wool appearance due to extensive um, osteolysis and then sclerosis. So then you have this cotton wool um, appearance. So on histology, Paget's disease is characterized by an arrangement of fragments of newer bone laid down on partially destroyed segments of older bone, which in turn may contain fragments of yet older bone, partially destroyed, which eventually leads to this kind of unfinished bone and then new bone on the unfinished bone, and it leads to this mosaic pattern. As you can see here, this top image is osteoclast, leaving behind this fibrous lytic um, this would be lytic on the CT scan. They leave behind this fibrous tissue and then they replace it with new bone um, on this unfinished bone. So then you get this mo mosaic pattern of bone. Now the um, top right is a, a section through the pyramid of a 74 year old female. This pagetoid remodeling is seen in the cochlear uh, capsule and near the modialis. And then there's a fracture right here of the um, partition between the lower basal turn and middle cochlear turn. Again, you can see this vast hypervascular nature of the disease here with these new um, neovascularization near the otic capsule in this region of this bottom right slide. So the management, initially symptomatic management is um, 
due to the bone pain or headaches. Indications for treatment include hypercalcemia, cranial neuropathies, um, as you would see from the foramenal um, narrowing or bony deformity. Now, bisphosphonates are first line and act to reduce increased rate of bone turnover. Calcitonin acts to inactivate osteoclasts and leads to reduction in bone resorption. And other drugs, as you can see right listed right here, have shown to reduce the neurologic sequelae. Now, itidronate sodium, disodium is a potent inhibitor of bone resorption, has been used to treat Paget's disease. This is a 1988 study of two patients who found improvement in pure tone hearing. As you can see, the top is pre-treatment and the bottom is post-treatment. Um, after combination, calcitonin, itidronate. Um, now, this has not been seen with bisphosphonates, and there are no untoward side effects. However, they did require daily subcutaneous injections after um, of calcitonin, which is the method of delivery for this medication. Um, there is no long-term follow-up, and discontinuing the medication, dis, um, uh, did, they didn't discontinue the, the medication to see if hearing um, uh, preservation remained. Remember, you can always consult your rheumatologist and endocrinologist um, for these patients. So as far as surgical therapy, stapedectomy may give equivocal results. Dr. Um, Waltner analyzed the footplates of three patients, demonstrated new bony involvement. The air bone gap was unable to be closed um, in any. And this corroborated with multiple other studies and is consistent with the incomplete understood pathophysiology of conductive hearing loss and patches disease. Baja has been successful, uh, successful if they have the appropriate bone puritan average. This is case reported as 72-year-old male um, whose puritan average improved from 60 to 30. And then CI has also been successful without increased complications. Um, and this is a case report of a 59-year-old male who achieved a word recognition score of 95% um, postoperatively and intraoperatively the cochlea was patent. Now, malignant degeneration can occur in 1%, um, but is more likely, so up to five to 10% in patients with severe polyostatic disease. And this is um, most commonly osteogenic sarcoma if they have a rat rise in ALP, then consider malignant de degeneration. So osteogenesis imperfecta, also known as Vanderhoef syndrome. This is a connective dis um, tissue disorder, also known as brittle bone disease. And a pathologic hallmark is the, is the deposition of um, immature bone tissue that's weak and fragile. The above the right um, top right image shows a um, demineralized uh, humerus that is also fractured. Um, now, 80 to 90% of patients have this CLL1, CLL1A2 mutation, which codes for type 1 collagen. And there are four types of osteogenesis imperfecta. And the type 1 is the classic form that we all know of, which is um, autosomal dominant in nature with fragile bones, blue sclera, and hearing loss. So this blue sclera is actually caused by thin scleral collagen, allowing the underlying darker choroid vasculature to be seen. Um, there are three other types after this that we don't need to um, get into, but type two is the most severe form and it's autosomal recessive and also in results in stillbirth. Um, so otologic symptoms. So hearing loss is a very common symptom Actually, 11% of patients are implant eligible, and it's mixed in 50%, um, conductive in 25, and sensorial um, in 15%. Now, the under, there's an unclear under etiology of the sensorial hearing loss, but interestingly, it occurs more in patients with white or gray sclera, which is one of the types of osteogenesis imperfecta, whereas conductive hearing loss occurs in patients with more often with blue sclera. Now it reflects uh, osticular structural abnormalities such as microfractures um, and uh, due to the fragility of the ossicles. The stapial footplate is most often fixed. And then 
So the, the way that this is different from otosclerosis is that it occurs here earlier than otosclerosis typically would. Now, there's no correlation between the hearing loss and the fractures, and then there's rare facial nerve dysfunction, but it can be irreversible if it happens because the dysplastic bone can damage segments of the nerve. So diagnosis is by high resolution CT in history. Now, this is very similar to otosclerosis in that it can show fenestral or even retrofenestral hypodensity. However, as the, the, the disease progresses, it shows this more diffuse resorptive changes as you can see in these scans around the otis capsule that wouldn't be seen in otosclerosis. Additionally, the history will be telling. The patient may have a history of fractures after minor trauma in childhood. They could have a, a family history of osteogenesis imperfecta. And if you check their eyes and they have blue sclera, then that kind of seals the diagnosis for you. And then this is different from um, Paget's disease, which is often monostatic, as we recall, and asymmetric in contrast to the bilateral involvement of osteogenesis imperfecta. So on histopathology, this is a slide section through the otic capsule. This is the periosteum. This is endochondral layer, and this is the endosteum here. What you see is deficient mineralization of the endochondral layer, this layer of the otic capsule, which shows increased amounts of fibrous tissue with numerous blood vessels. The periosteal layer is often thin and deficient. Um, on the bottom left is a section from a 15-year-old patient. The osteogenesis has replaced the endochondral and periosteal layers of the otic capsule. The malleus neck you can see here is also involved. Now, here's a picture, uh, here's a slide of otosclerosis. So the otopathology here is very similar to that seen in otosclerosis, even with stapes fixation. However, the abnormal bone that, involve, um, that involves the periosteum and, endo, and endochondral layer of the otocapsule here and here in osteogenesis imperfecta is not seen in otosclerosis, whereby in otosclerosis, it's only the endochondral layer that is involved, as you can see here. So um, management. Now, bisphosphonate therapy is being increasingly used because these drugs are potent inhibitors of bone resorption um, and turnover. You can see a trend in all these bony disorders and bisphosphonates are, are often used. Other therapies under investigation include the use of growth hormone and allergenic bone marrow transplantation. There is an active clinical trial ongoing with the goal of 100 patients with osteogenesis imperfecta and hearing loss to see if hearing outcome changes while on, um, hearing outcomes change while on um, the bisphosphonate re resogenate. Um, this should be completed by November 2024. So um, if you have any patients, then you can encourage them to keep an eye out for that. Um, <laughs> So surgical problems that are seen is there, there's a thin canal wall skin, there's a brittle skewum, brittle skewdem, and uh, stapedial curl fractures and atrophic cura, as well as easy mobilization of the foot plate and excessive bleeding. So foot plates are typically thick and frequently very soft with increased vascularity and the ink is long process may be fragile and prone to fracture during crimping. So those are all very important surgical considerations to think about when um, considering stapy surgery. However, it is still recommended in cases that meet indications. This is a 2005 study that reported on 23 cases overall um, who went, underwent a stapedotomy with vein graft interposition and reconstruction with a Teflon prosthesis or a bucket handle prosthesis. The post-operative ear bone gap closure to within 10 decibels was achieved within, with 86% of cases. Um, and the um, post-operative improvement of air conduction thresholds higher than 20 decibels was achieved in 60% of cases. So um, cochlear out endpoint outcomes are also similar to those um, who are non-affected. In this 2005 study, um, this is just two patients, which um, 
the operation, uh, the implant can be uh, more difficult, however, because of the hypervascularity of the bone and the narrowing um, dimensions of the cochlear channel. Um, however, things to consider is that once the device is placed, the bone nut does not shield electrically, electrical stimulating current because of the lower bone density. So this can sometimes lead to facial nerve um, stimulation and requiring reprogramming. So this is an overview of the four disease processes I just covered. So we'll talk about fibrous dysplasia you can see on the top here and here. Um, these are the clinical manifestations and these are radiologic findings. So you can see fibrous dysplasia that the, there is a very uncommonly centrinal component, um, but more common is the cochlear, uh, is the conductive hearing loss. Now, external auditory canal stenosis is very common, but then this middle ear involvement, otic capsule involvement, IAC stenosis is, is very um, uncommon. And we remember the um, CT findings. So osteopetrosis is, if you can think about it as a diffuse foramenal narrowing, as well as involvement of the ossicles. So, so there is, um, everything is game in the calvarium. So you have um, neural hearing loss, so IAC stenosis, facial nerve dysfunction, EAC stenosis, IAC stenosis, and then middle ear involvement. Um, and then we already reviewed the CT findings. Now, Paget's disease has more of a mixed picture with this common central component, more common than the other um, uh, disease processes. And then remember, you can see this um, uh, otic capsule thinning. Otherwise, the foramina are very rarely involved. And then osteogenesis imperfecta is um, uh, similar to non-cochlear otosclerosis, and that would be teased out with uh, um, this finding that cochlear otosclerosis, you would find this central hearing loss, but in osteogenesis perfecta is very uncommon. Um, and as well as the CT findings that we discussed with that diffuse resorption. So let's cover an imaging overview. So on this top um, left image, you can see this is a unilateral ground glass involvement of the bone and the sparing of the otic capsule. And so that's fibrous dysplasia. And the bottom middle, you see this thickened um, calvarium, this wide and diploic space, this sclerosis. It's kind of more asymmetric. Um, and that's Paget's disease. And you can again see the otic capsules um, involved. So in the top um, right, it is diffuse resorption of bone around the otic capsule. It's a bilateral disease process. Um, this is more than would be seen in otosclerosis, and that's osteogenesis imperfecta. And in the bottom right, you have this diffuse, dense, chalky bone, narrowing of the foramina, and that's osteopetrosis. An easy way to remember this for me and to categorize it is to think of them as generally unilateral diseases and generally bilateral disease. Now, um, there are exceptions, especially with these two disease processes, more often than not, they are unilateral. So thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.